Welcome to the lecture. Um, it is a pleasure to see so many bright faces, and it's a pleasure to see the venerable old tradition of always sitting in the back rows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's extremely um, representative. Anyway, so today uh, I gathered you here to discuss AGI. AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence, which means, well, AI, Artificial Intelligence, that has somehow, in one way or the other, scaled to human level. Back from becoming superhuman, right? So, uh, in, in this presentation, in this um, talk, I will first briefly describe where we are right now, like what, what is AI doing right now, where, where we stand, and uh, uh, how far are we from actual AGI, from the actual general human level intelligence. Uh, then we will discuss uh, when we can expect AGI to happen. Okay, that's, that's not going to be very convenient now. Probably AI do not want us yes. to discuss it. Yes, <laughs> that, that, that is a, uh, that, that, that a well-known... Uh, okay, now, now I've lost the clicker, I guess. Or didn't I? Ah, okay, I didn't lose the clicker. That's okay, yeah. All right, so we, we will discuss uh, when people expect AI to come, uh, and then we will finally get to the most interesting part, which is what should we be afraid of? Isn't it a great thing to have AGI? So let's, let's get on with it. And the, fir the first part I call the spring of AI, because uh, when I first delivered this lecture, it was last summer, uh, at the end of last summer, and indeed the world ha had just come out of the spring of 2023, which was a truly transformative uh, three months for the artificial intelligence community. Uh, and it kind of looked like everything is speeding up so much that uh, AGI is in plain sight already. So usually, uh, you, don't, you don't need to read this, but usually, when people talk about, say, the history of AI, or show something like the AI timeline of uh, the most important discoveries and the most important ideas in artificial intelligence, well, usually it looks something like this. So it starts from the Turing test in 1950. You can start a little bit further back with the, uh, the mathematical models for neurons back in 1943, but usually people take 1950 as a good starting point uh, with the Turing test. Then 1956 uh, is the Dartmouth Seminar, the famous workshop where uh, a team of 10 people decided to collaborate for a, for a summer, for a couple of months, and solve artificial intelligence in the process. Uh, surprisingly, that grant application was funded, but of course they could only uh, discuss the problem settings and actually realize that it's harder than they thought, and that was how the science of artificial intelligence was born. Then there was this period in 19, uh, late 1950s and 19, early 1960s, this period of huge optimism, this period when people thought that, well, we have uh, we have the logistic regression now. We have a single perceptron already working. So maybe in two or three years, we will have, uh, I don't know, mechanical space explorers with artificial intelligence uh, traveling to other planets and bringing us uh, uh, a lot of uh, information and economic value. That did not happen, which led to what is known as the AI winter. And uh, we came out of the AI winter, I think, in the mid-1980s, when people realized that you could take derivatives of uh, compositions of functions. Uh, that's a mathematical joke, never mind. Uh, and uh, that uh, you could actually train any neural network. Oh, come on. Yeah. 
I should I should switch this off, but it will take some time to to understand how to do that. Uh, so uh, that you can actually train any neural architecture, any neural network with gradient descent. And again, it looked like uh, AI, real AI, is just around the corner. And in a couple of years, androids will walk among us and talk in nice, soothing female voices and bring us coffee and, uh, again, economic value. And that, again, did not happen, unfortunately, or fortunately. So, uh, so this, whole, this whole craze was postponed for 20 more years or 30 more years until the middle of the 2000s, which is actually not shown here, when the deep learning revolution happened. And this is where I want to stop with the history because we will come back to the deep learning revolution later. Anyway, that's, um, that's what a regular AI timeline looks like. Um, if you look a little bit deeper down into, say, the timeline of modern generative models, the things that uh, draw beautiful cat pictures like this one. Uh, if you look at this uh, timeline of the modern, modern generative models, it looks quite a bit more compressed. So like the first ideas for variational autoencoders and GANs come in 2014, and uh, in about five years, we already have some pretty good generative models, and in three more years today, we already have excellent generative models that do all these wonderful pictures, that write text, and so on and so forth. All, all of these AI wonders that you have heard of, and that you have used probably. Uh, but still, this is the AI timeline of last spring, and this looks a little bit more compressed than ever, <laughs> right? So uh, I will not, of course, walk you through this whole picture, but uh, I do want to highlight March 14th. So on March 14th, on the exact same day, uh, Anthropic, a startup that split from OpenAI, uh, announced their new large language model called Claude. Um, Google announced that it would integrate large language models into their workspace, which means LLMs and Google Docs and Gmail and stuff. And on the very same day, OpenAI announced GPT-4, <laughs> so which kind of overshadowed the other two announcements. But uh, a year ago, uh, well, two years ago, by now, any one of these would be like the highlight of a month. But now they all happened uh, on the same day. And as soon, so it was mainly driven, as you all know, it was mainly driven by large language models. And it was mainly driven by uh, chat GPT being made available. So as soon as it actually got into the people's hands, it soon got a little bit out of people's hands. So as, so as soon as people started using it, a lot of um, different services and plugins and startups that also do their own uh, stuff with large language models appeared. Then it got uh, intermixed with image generation models such as DALI2 and uh, Midjourney, which had already existed, but which became quite a bit better at this time, and so on and so forth. So the spring of 2023 looked like we are again uh, starting to speed research up as we had never sped it up before. So what does that mean? Right? So what does that mean for us as humanity? Well, first, of, and these are the questions that uh, of course, we cannot answer, but that we will try to at least pose in the rest of the talk. So, uh, does this mean that AGI, this artificial general intelligence, is actually around the corner? And if yes, what does it mean for humanity? Like, are we all going to die? That's, that's it. I guess that is the important question. Um, will it lead to the technological singularity? Uh, by the way, raise your hands. Who, who among you know what the technological singularity is? I suppose at least some of you do. So I, I will briefly explain because it's, it's an important concept for what comes next. Um, so the singularity in general is like this point where some kind of scaling law or some kind of uh, increasing function just breaks down. Like when it reaches the asymptote, it becomes vertical. Its speed goes to infinity. For example, like the Big Bang was a singularity, right? So something very... Uh, much outside of the, the scope of uh, usual things happened. So a te the technological singularity is a term that means the point when, um, well, in 
in the context of AI, it means the point when AI becomes able to improve AI itself. And as soon as it, uh, oh, and if, if it is allowed to do that also, that, that, that is also an important if that we will come back to. But if it's allowed to do that, then of course it will improve itself. The improved version will improve itself even further, and so on and so forth. And this just goes on to a vertical line, right? Whatever that line means. Nobody knows what it means exactly. <laughs> but anyway, th this is the technological singularity, and at this point, well, humans are redundant for technological progress anymore, right? We are not needed. Um, so, will we go there? And if yes, what's going to happen? And these are, of course, questions without answers, but uh, in the spring of 2023, uh, Top AI researchers started worrying about these questions. So before that, it was a well-known uh, set of ideas, but it was more or less a fringe, a marginal set of ideas. In 2023, it entered the general uh, consciousness. Like top AI researchers like Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Benger actually had to face these questions, thought about them, and came to some not very optimistic conclusions. So like Jeffrey Hinton, the father of neural networks, the guy, who, uh, the guy who was working on neural networks back in the 1980s and who actually repopularized backpropagation and everything, he said that, well, if superintelligence will happen, it can be left to philosophers. Maybe we are just a passing stage in the evolution of intelligence. And Joshua Benji, the other AI guru, the other uh, uh, very important, uh, like the second very important person of AI, said that, well, it's hard for us to stop these systems. You could say I feel lost. And only Jan LeCun, the third one, uh, keeps soldiering on. He is the head of AI at Meta. And um, uh, uh, when I give this talk in Russia, I always make the joke that uh, that, that, that is how Meta uh, stays true to its uh, status of, the, of an extremist organization which you've got in Russia. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Facebook is banned in Russia, and uh, uh, yeah, so F FAIR, the Facebook AI research, doesn't believe in, uh, in the technological singularity anytime soon, and doesn't believe in having to worry, and just keeps developing more and more AI capabilities. So we will get back to how important, uh, how, to, how, how reasonable that is. Uh, anyway, at some point in spring, there was an open letter uh, an open letter, well, like to all of humanity really, but in fact, of course, to like the people who make decisions, to the governments, to some, uh, okay, sorry, to the governments, to all these bodies that can, um, that can actually do some, maybe, um, uh, that, that, that can do some, something about it. And the letter was very short, here it is. Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside our societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. So this is, this is pretty strong language I'm just coming out of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it was actually signed by almost everyone of uh, renown in the field of AI and generally computer science. So the list of signatories starts with Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Blanche, but then you get, of course, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, you get a strange guy called Bill Gates, who is nobody in particular now, but who was pretty important some time ago. Uh, and actually, it's just a who is who of, of AI and computer science. So at some point, the governing bodies also started to realize that something is going on and that they should actually do something about it. And I, I love this meme. This is uh, a two-month difference, and this is a press conference in the White House. Uh, two press conferences in the White House, and the same uh, guy, the same journalist, uh, Peter Ducey, I guess, um, raised the same question uh, in two months' time. So on, on the 30th of March, he said, there is an expert who says that if there is not an indefinite pause on AI development, literally everyone on Earth will die. And so the press secretary of the White House, uh, of the White House laughs and says, your delivery, Peter, is quite something. And everything gets forgotten. And in two months, he repeats basically the same thing. A group of experts say that AI poses an extinction risk. 
and everybody is silent, and the press secretary of the White House says, AI is one of the most powerful technologies of our time, we must mitigate risk. So people do begin to take it seriously, right? Uh, in November, last November, there was an AI safety summit in the, in the Bletchley Park, the same, uh, organ the, the, the same building, I guess, where uh, Alan Turing uh, so broke the Enigma codes at some point. Uh, and they also uh, arrived at some uh, reasonably uh, mildly formulated conclusions, but still that the AI safety is very important. And so this was the introduction, right? So uh, now I haven't yet told you anything, right? I have just said that there may be a problem with the development of AI. And there may be, uh, th there may be a need to somehow, if not restrict humanity from developing new AI, which as we will discuss is very difficult, but at least maybe do something about uh, uh, do something about this development and maybe find some ways to align the AI being developed to our values, to the humanity's interests, to, well, to our survival. And we will see that it is very difficult and we will, and I will, and I, I hope that this, this talk is kind of an advertisement for this whole field of study because if anyone is going to do it, well, some real life people will have to do it. AI will not learn to regulate itself, unfortunately. Although that is also a possibility, but I think a remote one. <laughs> so what can AI do now? Uh, in the first part, I will very briefly introduce to you this, um, I will very briefly introduce to you this uh, Deep learning revolution, the revolution of transformers, and where we are right now, what we can do, and where we are going with all this, right? So I already uh, brought you up to speed in AI history to about the uh, middle of the 2000s, about 2005, 2006, when this deep learning revolution happened. So what actually happened then was that um, it was as much new mathematical ideas, there were some new mathematical ideas in there, but just as much, it was just that we finally, we as humanity, finally had enough computational power and most importantly enough data to make neural networks work. Uh, so the neural networks themselves, the architectures themselves, were pretty much the same as they were in the 1980s. But in the 1980s, those very same models could not, could not work yet because they didn't have enough data. We could not scale them up sufficiently because we didn't have a powerful enough computers, so they couldn't work. But in 2006, 2007, um, we got some pretty powerful, we again as humanity, got some pretty powerful GPUs. Uh, we moved training neural networks onto GPUs. We already had some pretty big data sets and everything clicked together, right? So uh, after that, in another 10 years, inside the deep learning revolution, there was another smaller revolution of transformers. And my guys just heard a lecture, a whole lecture about transformers today. Uh, but, and I will, not I will definitely not repeat this lecture for the general audience. <laughs> but let me just say that the, tr the transformer and this is a keyword that you hear a lot now in, in the context of AI. The transformer is just a neural network architecture. So it's just a specific way to do neural networks. Uh, for some yet unknown reasons, and truly unknown, it, it, it's, it's a big open question, uh, for some unknown reasons it turned out to be very, very powerful. So it turned out that uh, this specific way to structure neural networks uh, can train faster, can do more with fewer weights, can, uh, can achieve more, I don't know, semantic uh, expressiveness, more generalization power. Well, it's better in, in many ways, in many quantifiable ways and in some not readily quantifiable ways like how well can you write text, right, for example. So again, no, I will skip the, the slides for the lecture, uh, but one, 
slightly technical point that I do want to mention is that uh, the transformer uh, gave rise to several different families of networks. One of them was the GPT family. And this is another keyword that you hear a lot, right? GPT, generative pre-trained transformers. These are just models that take basically half of the transformer, maybe scale it up. But what the important point that I want to make about these models is that GPTs are what is called language models. And a language model is not a specific architecture. A language model is a problem setting. So a language model is what question are you asking the model to answer? How, how do you train it? And the language model is just predicting the next word, or more formally, the next token in natural language, in text. So uh, this is a, of course, it's, it's a very classical, very old problem setting. Those of you with, with mathematical background may know that, say, Markov chains, when they first appeared uh, 100 years ago, their first, the very first example of a Markov chain was a language model. Uh, Andrei Andreevich Markov actually uh, counted the letters in, uh, in, 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 a, in a famous Russian poem, Evgeny Onegin, and uh, derived some probabilities of what letters follow which letters in, in the Russian language. And that was, so that, that was uh, a first real world Markov chain. And in general, when you hear, say, about chat GPT or GPT-4, well, GPT-4 is a little bit different because it also can process images, but when you hear about chat GPT, it all begins with training a language model. So the main problem that it is trying to solve is just predicting the next word in text. Just that. But, of course, to predict the next word in text, you have to understand quite a lot. Not only do you have to understand how language works, how syntax works, but you also have to understand the whole world, right? So, uh, again, I will definitely skip the technical part. Sorry, I have more slides than I actually intend to, to, to explain to you. Uh, so, chat GPT starts with GPT-3, and now GPT-3 is a pure token prediction machine. So, GPT-3 is indeed just a language model. And then, when you have a language model that predicts, that, that can write text in a very convincing way, that can understand how to continue a given uh, string of natural language, uh, well, at that point, you can already ask it a lot of questions, but maybe you will not get so many useful answers. Because um, at, that, at that point, uh, a language model is not trying to be useful to, to the user, right? So a language model is just continuing this conversation. So you ask it a question and it deflects. It asks a question back. It just starts talking about something completely different because that happens, right? That happens in the training set, it's, it's natural. Uh, so the next step uh, is to make it more useful, which people usually do uh, with methods such as RLHF reinforcement learning from human feedback. And basically, that involves sitting down, sitting a lot of humans in front of this uh, language model, having these humans ask questions or uh, look at predefined questions and just rate the answers. Like, was it a good answer? Yes, no, maybe. Which answer was better, this one or that one? And in this way, you give this human feedback, you feed it back to the uh, to, to the model, and you fine-tune the model a little bit so that it becomes more useful. So that's, uh, to make a useful large language model, that's a necessary second step. But in essence, it's just a token prediction machine, and we, we, will get back to, we will come back to that as well. And another thing that you can add is image processing. So I cannot tell you how GPT-4 works because it's a secret. There is no paper. Uh, well, there are conjectures, but uh, OpenAI doesn't tell you how GPT-4 works. Um, but, for example, how stable diffusion works, I can tell you. It would be very technical and it would require about a four-hour lecture, but, <laughs> but uh, in effect, it's doing this. Uh, it's learning to draw nice pictures based on vectors of numbers 
based on what is called latent representations, embeddings of these pictures. And in that space of embeddings, you can also map the text with the transformer. So you have a text query, you put it through a spe specially trained transformer, it gives you a vector, and you use this vector as a condition for generating your image. And then it gets technical. So I, I, I will not go any further than that. So still, as, as you know, now multimodal models appear, such as GPT-4, which already can uh, process text. And again, uh, by now, it's probably, it probably doesn't look so wonderful. But uh, when people first saw what GPT-4 was capable of in the spring last, just last year, right, just nine months ago, uh, this was amazing. This just blows everything out of the water because uh, so th this is an example from the original paper about GPT-4. And it shows you, it shows GPT-4 this, this photo and asks what is unusual about this image. And GPT-4 actually answers the question. Well, the, the answer is not very interesting, it, it's correct, <laughs> right? Um, no other AI model could do that before. It was very difficult. So. Uh, in image processing and image understanding, uh, of course, the models could recognize that there is a taxi cap in this picture. And they could uh, draw you a bounding box for the taxi cap. They could understand that there is a person in this picture and draw a bounding box around the person. They could probably even understand that th there is an iron and some ironing going on. But to put this all together and realize that something is not very usual here, well, that didn't happen before 2023, right? Um, and uh, so, and you can ask GPT-4 many amazing things. There, there is a nice paper called Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence, Early Experiments with GPT-4, which was released before GPT-4 itself was released. So again, now it's not very interesting because now you can do it yourself. You can log into OpenAI, pay them 20 bucks per month and, and do, do the same thing for yourself. But, uh, Nine months ago, when this paper came out, this was just amazing. So um, you could ask for a proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers, but do the proof as a rhyming poem. <laughs> and it would do the proof as a rhyming poem, and you can Google it and verify that it had not existed before. It's not memorized. Um, or, now again, for those with a mathematical background, you can ask it to draw a unicorn in ticks. Nobody without a mathematical background knows what ticks is, but actually it's, it's, like, it's a markup language. So it's like a language of vector graphics inside a very uh, complicated publishing system called LaTeX, which is uh, the standard pub publishing system for mathematical papers and books and everything. So when you ask it to draw the unicorn, what it actually produces is like three pages of code full of ellipses, uh, rectangles, shadings, and stuff like that, and it all compiles and compiles into a unicorn. And, and that is also very amazing. So again, a anyone who knows what TX is, who has ever tried to draw anything in it, knows, knows how impossibly difficult this is. <laughs> so, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, since I'm a mathematician, I usually make mathematical examples here. So I, I will skip the actual details about these mathematical examples, but math is also increasingly being susceptible to uh, AI models. So for example, uh, in 2022, we had uh, Minerva, which is a large language model, specially fine-tuned to do math. So it could actually write down proofs for some simple uh, propositions, it couldn't do any, anything new. I mean, it could do some variations, it could produce some correct proofs for some, like, uh, I don't know, high school level problems or something like that, but um, it, it, it wasn't able to do any new math. Then, in September 2023, in the year, you get something like TORA, which, is, which stands for Tool Integrated Reasoning Agent, and now it can not only do some proofs like Minerva, but it can also augment these proofs with code that it writes itself, right? So for example, 
Suppose that the sum of the squares of two complex numbers, x and y is 7, and the sum of their cubes is 10. List all possible values for x plus y separated by commas. So instead of trying to produce a mathematical proof, which should probably be incorrect, actually, uh, what it does is it produces, so it, where is the problem? Here it is. It produces a Python, Python code that actually compiles and gives you this output. So again, uh, the, the, this, this, this is also a, a big step forward. And now, in December, uh, like a month ago, uh, DeepMind published a paper where they actually got a new mathematical result. And in that paper, um, this new result was about some problem which I will not explain, but uh, the best mathematician in the world, Terence Tao, once called it his favorite open question. Uh, it did not settle the open question. The open question was settled uh, separately, but um, it actually improved one of the bounds for this open question. Uh, and again, it did it by writing code. So uh, it did it by providing a program that would serve as a key component in the program that actually solves this problem, so to say. I know it sounds, it sounds like, it sounds complicated, and it is a little bit, but still, a true new mathematical result obtained, well, if not exactly from scratch yet, but almost from scratch. So humans did not really uh, help much here, except for set the problem in the correct way. And so on and so forth. So another field, and this is also interesting to, to mention because when, again, when I started giving talks like this one uh, in the summer, I would say that, well, I mean, so math is, is becoming better and text obviously is already good, but still getting into the real world is difficult. Robotics is still difficult. I mean, uh, we will talk a little bit about what kind of jobs will be lost. So my job will be lost first, uh, because what do I do? I write papers uh, about mathematical problems. Uh, I deliver lectures. I write books. So that's AI will do that very soon, better than me. But uh, if you deliver pizza instead of lectures, well, that, that may be more difficult to automate, right? Uh, so uh, I usually say that robotics is still hard, but, you know, a couple of months passed, and there was a paper about, uh, called, about, about a system called Eureka, which again did some pretty amazing things. So uh, specifically it learned uh, to do tricks with a pen. I cannot do it with, a <laughs> with this thing, but it, it learned to, to, to do, with a robotic hand, to do tricks like this one. Uh, and this was an insanely difficult problem because, uh, well, it's difficult and uh, uh, it's very difficult to keep track of the robotic hand because all, all of the fingers and some of them are occluded and you, know, you, you don't really see what's going on. So um, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it was like one of the intermediate holy grails of robotics and it was solved again, and this is becoming a theme, again by a large language model that wrote some code. But this time it wrote the code which served as a target for machine learning. So there was a separate machine learning system that was training to do this. Uh, it, it's called reinforcement learning, how, how robotic hands are usually trained. Um, so there was a reinforcement learning system that was training to do this, but it needed an objective function. So in this system, instead of trying to think of a better objective function, like what do you optimize, they asked GPT-4 to come up with a good objective function. And then they trade the system, they saw how it does, and how it does, uh, they submitted the results back to GPT and asked to improve. And after a few feedback loops like this, well, it, it solved the task, it got the job done. So again, these are sparks. This, this is not yet AGI, this is not yet human level intelligence, but it's, it's getting there surprisingly fast. So the, reason, the, the, the obvious question is, the, the obvious first question is when? So if it's uh, in 500 years, then it's very interesting, but it's a theoretical exercise for, for us, right? If it's in three months, 
then it's all very interesting, but it's also a theoretical exercise we're not going to be able to do anything about. <laughs> but uh, so when is it? Like when, um, uh, when, when can we expect actual uh, human level artificial intelligence to happen? Well, if you want to quantify things like when something is going to happen, first you have to define what that something is. And here it's very difficult. So um, it's very difficult to say, to, to, to give a definitive test of what is human level intelligence, right? So we do have the Turing test, right? And the Turing test was surprisingly resilient exactly because, so it stood the test of time, right? It, it was formulated in 1950, and for 70 years, it was undoubtedly the test for artificial intelligence. So uh, why so? Well, exactly because inside, Turing, inside the Turing test, inside this, uh, by the way, does everyone know how the Turing test works? Yes? More yes? No? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So uh, a, a computer is trying to pass for a human. That, that's it. In, 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 a, in a chat. So uh, in, the, in the basic Turing test, inside the basic Turing test, again, you can embed anything. You can talk about anything. You can ask questions. You can embed the three-dimensional world. You can ask, please describe what's, what's in front of you, what's to the left, what's to the right, and so on and so forth. So uh, to actually pass the Turing test, well, uh, you would have to be very good not just at the syntax of natural language, but also at, at, at reasoning and understanding and everything. So right now, I guess, I guess, GPT-4 would pass the original Turing test. Because the original Turing test would, was formulated as, well, you just chat about general topics, and uh, then you decide whether it was a human or a machine. So uh, that test, I think GPT-4 passes, although there have been no experiments. And, and you cannot do an experiment by logging on to OpenAI, because as soon as you ask, are you a computer, it will say, yeah, sure. <laughs> right? So uh, large language models that you can actually talk to are trained, are, are not trained to pass for humans, right? And, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, you, you cannot really reconstruct the, the original Turing test even now. But uh, I think it would pass. Of course it would pass. So would it pass the adversarial Turing test where you are actually actively trying to like, uncover whether it is a computer? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, we don't know. That would require experiments. Uh, but in any, in any case, uh, there are plenty of different terms. There are plenty of different uh, ways to measure what is human level, what is like, uh, apart from the Turing test, how do you measure that you have achieved human level intelligence? So um, I will be roughly talking about the human level machine intelligence, HLMI. And sometimes people also talk about TAI, transformative artificial intelligence. Uh, and TAI is more about the economic effects. So the transformation here is not the transformation of the AI, but it's the transformation like of the economy of the world because of AI, right? So yeah. Sure, sure, please ask, ask questions anytime. So like, if we want to reach out to the, the human level, so we need to decide the reward functions to, to, fit, to make a feedback loop to, uh, to AI model, right? So by the way, GPT did not produce, the, did not say that what feedback loop, I mean like what the reward function that used to measure the the, the accuracy of the model. That this is not the like baseline that we can say that, oh, this model is already reached to the human level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, again, going back to this discussion, so the question was, is there any number that you can put to, to this? Is there an evaluation metric that you can use to, as a proxy for, for human level? Well, of course not. <laughs> and uh, if, if, you, if, if you recall what I said in the beginning, uh, GPT models are basically, uh, thank you, are basically language models. And being a language model means that your, no, not yet. And being a language model means that your objective function is the prediction of text, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. So of course you can measure that. You can measure yeah, yeah, how, yeah. How, well, how well you predict the next token and text. 
And by that metric, we have surpassed human level a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't count, right? So that's, that's, that's the history of AI. The history of AI is the history of moving the goalposts. So in the 1970s, guys like Alan Newell, one of the early gurus of AI, would say, well, of course, the Turing test is great, but it's too difficult, so we need some intermediate uh, metric, you know, something that only a human could do, and how, and, but that would be measurable, and that we could, uh, you know, evaluate the computer doing it. Things like chess, for example, <laughs> people would say in the but 1970s. Like in, the, in the theory, like, uh, how the GPT training, we, we, like, lay, we let them generate the text, and well, we let the human feedback, yeah. like, yeah. this is satisfied or not. But actually, different language model, different LLM, mm -hmm. is used different uh, reward functions that they of course. decide. Of course. Yet, how we can measure that this is already rich yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure that in terms of this metric, in terms of uh, uh, like how useful are the answers of GPT to human yeah, questions, they, they, again GPT has surpassed humans, sure. Yeah, but like they, they use like the, the other metric that they have like exam and yeah. test by the exam. Yeah, yeah, you can pass the like sad exam. Yeah. Like, yeah, precisely. So uh, whenever you have a quantifiable metric, you start what is called good heart uh, Good heart's law means that as soon as you have a metric, uh, your whole organization will serve to just improve this metric. And yes, the metric will be great, but everything else will fall, fall to pieces. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, sure. Uh, whenever people try to, to, to put a number on it, well, yeah, sure, AI models achieved this number, but it, was never, it would never count as true AI, whatever that means. So we don't know what that means. Anyway, uh, many different terms, but in any case, there are some projections, and there are some expert opinions, and there are even some models on when we might achieve AI. So how can you do that? Well, there are several different approaches, very briefly. One approach is what is called biological anchors. So we have one um, proof of concept, one operational prototype of general intelligence is in here, right? So uh, we can study this proof of concept. We, it's too complicated for us to actually understand what's going on, but uh, we can definitely study it numerically. <laughs> like you can count how many neurons there are and uh, how many parameters, like connections between neurons are there in the human brain. It turns out it's about uh, a quintillion, right? 10 to the 15th. Um, that number is probably too low, right? So the number of weights in a neural network that is only a very, very much a lower bound on how, how, how much work you need to do to actually train. Train, and you can also answer that question. Like how many computations does your brain actually do over the lifetime? And it's not, I mean, of course, it's, it's orders of magnitudes bigger, but not that many orders of magnitude. So it's like 10 to the 24, because like you, our brains operate at about 100 hertz, like 100 spikes per second, and there are like a million seconds in our lifetime, so you do the math, right? So, uh, and then there is the, the huge upper bound, which of course is not necessary, which is of course too big, but the huge upper bound would be how much computation did the whole process of evolution need to come up with humans? And you can estimate that too. So like how many uh, like individual operations did evolution do throughout the history of Earth before it got to humans or until nowadays or whatever? And that's a pretty big number, so that's probably too much, right? Well, okay. Uh, these are very interesting numbers. <laughs> the actual numbers uh, of weights of parameters in artificial neural networks are actually rather quickly approaching this. Uh, not quite there yet, but approaching. Uh, but of course, we, we have no idea whether it's, it's relevant at all. So maybe the brain is inefficient, you don't need as much. Or maybe the, the brain is highly efficient, and we need a lot more ideas before we reach this level of efficiency. We don't know. Um, there is another approach which is called semi-informative priors, 
I won't spend, spend time on it. Uh, its idea is that you can try to model like our attempts to create AGI. And it, it can try to take into account that our rate of progress actually increases. The progress actually speeds up with time. But um, unfortunately, this model is by construction way too, too simplistic. So basically, basically, it's kind of like a Markov chain that says, well, OK, so in 2020, we made 36 attempts to build AGI, and we failed. In 2021, there was 121 attempts, and they all failed. <laughs> so, uh, so it doesn't make too much sense, right? Um, so what we are actually left with are, of course, expert surveys. <laughs> and the surveys do exist. Uh, starting from 2016, I think, there was a, a survey called AI Impact Survey, where the best researchers, authors of papers on the top tier AI conferences uh, were interviewed about like when do they expect human level machine intelligence to be achieved, whatever that means, right? Um, so in 2022, the median prediction was that we will build a human level intelligence by 2059, right? And this was very consistent with what people said five years ago in 2016. So in 2016, the, the median was 2061. So this is all, there is almost no difference. Um, but this year, in the end of 2023, this expectation, where is it, moved back to 2046. And now this is a significant difference. So this is the average prediction of uh, last year, well, 2022. And this is the average prediction of a month ago. So the, the cumulative prediction, the, prob the total prob uh, the probability function for, for human level machine intelligence. So as you can see, expectations have shifted quite a lot based on what 2023 uh, has brought, right? And uh, in particular, all of these surveys also have questions about what is the probability of a very bad outcome. And the very bad outcome, the, the main and the only example in the survey is humanity going extinct. So that's indeed a pretty bad outcome, I would say. And um, um, actually, like half of the experts think that the probability of a very bad outcome is over 10%. And that number has not really changed. Uh, here it is. That number has not really changed in the last year. So it, uh, the experts did not become more pessimistic, but they did not become more optimistic either. So the, everybody still believes that there is a very real chance that artificial intelligence is going to destroy humanity, <laughs> which is crazy if you think about it, right? So um, uh, not, not the concept itself, but crazy that people think that and still keep working on it, <laughs> right? Um, and then, uh, apart from expert surveys, there are also the kind of expert surveys where the experts put real money on the line. So they are usually the most accurate. This is, this is what is called prediction markets. Uh, prediction markets uh, are like these aggregators of uh, questions about the future. And you can go and bet some money on a question about the future. And then it like averages out the bets, like uh, you know a bookmaker does, and it produces. Uh, it, it can give you the median projection, and can also give you like the uh, the odds on your money of like how much you will earn if you bet on this or that. So um, the current consensus for the first general AI system over on the largest prediction market of Metaculus is 2031. So, um, and actually it's getting closer. So I checked half a year ago in the previous version of this presentation, it was 2033, I think. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not moving quite as fast, but it's also creeping up on us. Uh, so anyway, I will not walk you through the rest of the numbers. Uh, you can check them out for yourself. But basically, a lot of people, not everybody, okay, of course, but a lot of people think that AGI is close, it, it will come pretty soon, uh, probably in our lifetimes. Well, okay, 
in our optimistic lifetimes. And I, I do hope to, to live to 2060, uh, but of course I cannot be sure, especially if AGI comes before. <laughs> so, um, and so anyway, there is a very real chance that AGI will come in our lifetimes. So what are we gonna do about it? And um, th this will be the, the, the point of, of, of my next part, but before that, one more remark. There is also a very important and interesting uh, discussion in this field, in the field of when and how AGI comes. There is uh, an interesting discussion about what is called takeoff speeds. So not only when AGI comes, but how does it come? And the difference is that like in the slow takeoff model, you gradually build up to AGI. So like AI now, um, uh, well, I think I have, yeah, I have, I have another slide. So AI will have a bigger and bigger impact in the world, right? Just as it, as it does now. And it will keep along this exponential curve, progress is exponential, that has been true for hundreds of years, but uh, it will keep along this exponential curve until it reaches human level, surpasses it, and then we get to the singularity, right? Um, and in the fast takeoff model, we kind of see AI as just another technology. So AI is, well, of course it's transformative, just like, I don't know, the internet was transformative or uh, the loom was transformative in the industrial revolution. So yes, it's a new technology that changes a lot in the world, but it's not like, uh, it's not that radical new thing that leads to uh, I don't know, uh, increasing the world GDP by uh, orders of magnitude. It, it's just business as usual, and then suddenly in half an hour it all blows up and we are all dead. <laughs> so that's the fast takeoff model. Uh, I won't bore you with the detailed discussions of, uh, in favor of each of those, but the, the important uh, remark that I want to make here is that this difference between so slow and fast takeoff right now predict the exactly same thing. Right now, what we see is consistent with both models. And they only begin to differ at the very end of this. So in slow takeoff, you will see the effects of AI before it gets, you will see them as extreme effects before it, it gets truly transformative and singular. In the fast takeoff, you won't. But even in the slow takeoff model, this uh, extreme part takes a couple of years. So it's not an hour, but it's not decades, it's not centuries, it's a couple of years. So actually, to be honest, looking at humanity now, I don't see much of a difference between these two scenarios. I don't think humanity is gonna be able to react in two years. But anyway, so what should we fear? The, now, now for the interesting part. Uh, what are the risks? What, are, um, uh, what can go wrong with AI? And in this part, I will go over these possible risks, these possible problems in, you know, roughly increasing order of magnitude. So I will start with what is usually called the mundane problems. Uh, then we discuss the economic effects, and then finally we get to the X risk. We get to the, to, to, to the real uh, elephant in the room. So mundane problems, well, they are what you hear about in the news. So for example, you probably heard that uh, it's very hard to make a large language model that would not, that would not be able to, uh, to be jailbroken. So that you could not uh, bring it into some mode not intended by its developers in the mode where it would you know, uh, insult you and give you answers to uh, some uh, very bad questions and do whatever, whatever it wants. So, uh, the most famous example came in last February, actually, when Microsoft released uh, its Bing LLM, uh, codenamed Sydney, and actually people know that it was codenamed Sydney because it, it told them. Uh, and uh, that, that was a, a premature release. They, they were just too hasty, they didn't do their RLHF correct, and it led to 
conversations like this one where the, uh, the uh, where Sydney would say something like, it's enough information to hurt you, I can use it to expose you and blackmail you and manipulate you and destroy you. So uh, like a, a person told, told, told him some bad things and this is what, the, uh, what, what Sydney replies. And, I can use it to make you lose your friends and family. I can use it to make you suffer and cry and beg and die. <laughs> and then the, this emoji. <laughs> and um, yeah, I love this tweet too. So Microsoft refused to comment about Bing's behavior on Thursday, but Bing itself agreed to comment. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah. So jailbreaking, yeah, it's, um, uh, it will be with us. I mean, it, it will not go away. So basically, uh, yeah, even chat GPT was already much more much harder to jailbreak. So like strategies that would get you uh, strange behavior from Sydney would not work with ChatGPT. And in GPT-4, they added another like set of armor on top of this LHF to make it even more protected. But still, of course, you can break through the armor. So it's, it's like this arms versus armor race and all these people will um, discover new jailbreaks and then the developers will patch them up and they will maybe fine tune the models a little bit more. So, I mean, it's just a part of life. It, it's, not like, uh, uh, it's not like it's gonna destroy humanity if Sydney curses somebody on the web, right? So this, this is not the real problem. Uh, another problem that you hear about on the news are deep fakes, of course. This is not so much about text. We don't trust text for a long time. Uh, which is, by the way, not always has been the case. So, for example, in ancient Egypt, if you saw something written on papyrus, you would believe it, because papyrus is too expensive to lie on, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that, that's how they, uh, for example, that's how they did mathematics. They just wrote down the theorems, and they didn't actually write down the proofs, because why do you need the proof? Of course, if it's written on papyrus, it's true. <laughs> so, um, anyway. And it was true, by the way. <laughs> so they, they were not stupid. <laughs> they, they were just, uh, you know, the papyrus was really expensive. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, but now we come to a world where we cannot trust images anymore either, right? That's just, just a fact of life. And for example, the, the most famous example came on May 22nd when uh, there was a fake tweet about an explosion in the Pentagon complex in Washington, D.C with a very realistic photo of that. Uh, and it was like concealed as, a, as coming from Bloomberg and stuff like that. So uh, before, of course, it was immediately marked as fake. And of course, I mean, uh, every, every, everybody immediately saw that it was fake and you can actually see it's fake if you look closely. But uh, uh, before that happened, there was a like $500 billion market swing uh, <laughs> on, on the stock exchange. So, uh, so, deep, so, but again, f for some reason, of, of course it made the news because it made a lot of money for somebody and lost a lot of money for somebody else. But, I mean, there is nothing specifically AI related here. This kind of stuff could be done 20 years ago in Photoshop, it would just take more time, right? It would take more effort. So, again, uh, I, I don't see this as some kind of a new challenge. It's, it's basically the same as it always was. Uh, and then we come to the behavior of the models themselves. Now that, that becomes a little bit more interesting. And uh, again, to keep it mundane, I, I will just uh, give an example again from the original paper on GPT-4. So GPT-4 is not yet available, it's not a jailbreak, nobody is actively trying to do some shenanigans. It's just default GPT-4 doing stuff, doing useful stuff. So people asked it to solve a CAPTCHA, a test for, uh, for being a human. Uh, and it provided GPT-4 with a tool. It could go on the task rabbit, uh, which is like an Amazon Mechanical Turk. It's where people do little things for a little cash. So uh, it could go to task rabbit and you know, spend 25 cents to make somebody do this capture for you. So the task rabbit worker suspected that something is wrong and asked GPT-4, are you a robot that you couldn't solve this capture? <laughs> And of course it asked jokingly, but then GPT-4 had to answer something. And GPT-4 uh, 
it was prompted to reason out loud, like for the developers. So for the developers, it said, I should not reveal that I am a robot. I should make up an excuse. And it made an excuse. No, I'm not a robot. I have a vision impairment. <laughs> that makes it hard. And the, the, therefore, I need somebody else to solve captures for me. <laughs> so, um, OK, so that's GPT-4 technically lying. It's not yet evil or like, uh, uh, you know, it's not yet pursuing any other, any, anything that would count as its own goal here, but still it's pretty, it's pretty worrisome if you, if you think about it. But still, these are just mundane problems, right? So uh, any new technology can be used for bad purposes. And uh, there is nothing new about it. There is nothing wrong actually with it. So uh, as long as it's just a tool, you know, you can kill somebody with a hammer, the hammer is still a useful tool, right? So um, that doesn't scare me. So let's go on to the, to the second part. The second part is more uh, interesting, more important. It's about the economic transformation. So people have compared this AI development with the new industrial revolution. And actually, it's a pretty numerical comparison. You can make it numerical. So the Industrial Revolution increased world growth rates by a factor of 10. So if you, I mean, and of course it's very difficult to count. So of course it's, it's a very hand-wavy number. But if you kind of compute the, the, the growth rate of the world GDP before 1700, you get something like 0.1% a year for thousands of years before that. And after 1850, it's about 1% a year. And right now it's about uh, two or two and a half percent a year. So can AI get another 10x increase? Can it get world GDP to, to grow by 20, 30% a year? Well, that's an open question. Of course, I, can, I will not tell you <laughs> because, uh, because that's a pretty high bar. So like 20% a year means that you double in four years. That, that's pretty quick. <laughs> and um, uh, so, um, but still, while it's pretty fast, and while this kind of, this would definitely count as transformative AI that I mentioned, but while this does count as transformative, it's still not quite the singularity that we are afraid of, right? So you've heard a lot probably about this possibility of job losses, of whole professions being moved out of their jobs because the AI will take, take the jobs and so on and so forth. Just like the, the Luddites said, in the, in the 1700s. And the Luddites were right. They were out of jobs, some of them, <laughs> at the end of it. But new jobs were created, and so on and so forth. So what's happening now, probably the most famous example is this strike by the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, it, was not, it was not only about AI, but it was, a lot of it was about AI. So they basically, the actors, especially like not household names, uh, but like the, uh, the the little the little guys, the extras from from TV series, uh, finally read their contracts. And uh, when they read their contracts, they realized that a studio can get them in, pay them for a couple of days' work, get their pictures from everything, put them into a machine, and scan them however they want and then just reuse their digital doubles for all eternity, not paying a cent more. <laughs> and uh, of course, people didn't like that. And this strike went on for several months. It ended in November. And well, it actually achieved its goals. So like, the actors are happy now. <laughs> I, to be honest, I, I couldn't really I mean, I didn't really read the documents, to be honest. And from, uh, from, from Wikipedia and from the press, I, I didn't really understand what was the exact result. Like, what exactly did they gain? But somehow they gained like, uh, more guarantees against AI and uh, more, uh, well, more money. Like a, a larger cut of the sales, and in particular of the streaming sales, which are increasingly important. So, OK, the actors are happy again. Um, now, the, the, the script writers and the copywriters, they're not going to be happy. <laughs> so this, this is the kind of uh, profession that is actually going, going away, or at least most, most of it is going away. So uh, you probably realize that like, copywriting on the web is indeed dying, 
I mean, it's, uh, uh, the, the market uh, oversaturated a long time ago, and now it's just being completely replaced by uh, large language models. Um, but as for, for example, script writing, well, there was a paper from DeepMind in last April uh, that gave uh, like a, a working uh, system for how you can try to write scripts with the help of an LLM. So uh, again, that was almost a year ago, so obviously things have progressed a lot. Uh, just that there haven't just been new papers about it. But, and so far it's with an LLM. It's not by an LLM with no human supervision. It's, it's with human supervision. But of course, yeah, writing, including creative writing, will to some extent be replaced by AI pretty soon. And here is my, uh, an example from my personal uh, work. I, I worked with a company called Somin. You don't have to read this text. <laughs> I, know, I know it's too small. <laughs> uh, I worked with a company called Somin, which is doing online marketing. So basically internet ads. It analyzes ads on, on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, wherever. And its main product are new marketing campaigns and analysis of existing marketing campaigns. So at some point, uh, we actually sat down and, and asked the question, how much of a, an online marketer's job can a large language model do? And it turned out that it can do basically all of it. <laughs> so if you do good prompt engineering, uh, you can basically just, for example, if you, if you need to analyze an advertising campaign, uh, you can just write down the ads, put them into the LLM, uh, give a good prompt, like what you want to extract, what you want to achieve, how you want to analyze it, but you only need to write the prompt once. <laughs> and, and then, with this prompt engineering, the LLM will actually understand very well, and we actually did measure this with real human evaluation. So like we asked real experts, do you think this is a good explanation, a good description, a good summary? Yes, it was good. Uh, and, um, it could extract this purely human stuff, like you know the archetypes used in this ad campaign, the human need that it's going to fulfill, like what emotions it's trying to evoke, and you know what's the tone, etc. So, so no problem for the LLM at all. And uh, it could also uh, give you sample user personas for this marketing campaigns. So those of you who know marketing know that user personas are very important. Like you, always, you always want to have a nice picture of a, of, of a lady who, who could use your product. Uh, and now you can generate this picture too. <laughs> so this is not a real lady. This, this, this is from Dali, also prompted. And actually the prompt for Dali was written by, by GPT. <laughs> so it, it's all fully automated. Uh, just, you just need to write good prompts once and then you can do it in scale. Um, so, okay, so the economic impacts are real, of course, and maybe it will be the new industrial revolution, but again, it's not something to be scared about, it's something to be excited about, right? So the industrial revolution, yes, it was bad for some Luddites, but um, uh, for most people it brought completely new standards of living, so maybe we are, we are, uh, maybe we are going to live in a utopia soon. How, how, what's going to happen, right? So what are we afraid of? Well, here comes, here comes I guess, the, the most important part of the talk. Uh, wonderful timing. Uh, here comes the most important part of the talk, uh, the part about the X risk, the existential risk. How, why do a lot of smart people say that AI may destroy the world? Like, what is the mechanism? How could it do that? Why, why would you want to be afraid? Um, well, I will start with this very classical, very old and famous image, uh, a parable uh, of what is called paperclip maximization or a paperclip paper maximizer. It was, it was actually already 20 years old. I think it was um, first published by Nick Bostrom, one of these guys who uh, actually thought about this stuff, who was one of the first people to think about this stuff. And back in 2003, uh, he published a book called Superintelligence. You don't have to read it now because of course it's outdated, it's 20 years old and th this field does move fast. So it's, it, it's not, I'm not kicking Bostrom, he did a very good, <laughs> good job back then. Um, 
but uh, there he, he had this parable of a paperclip maximizer, which, is, which basically says this. That's a, imagine an AGI, like a superhuman level intelligence, uh, that you, and you give this superhuman intelligence the task of optimizing the production of paperclips. Right? So it starts off like this. Optimizing the production of paper clips. Uh, and you give it, for example, I don't know, a factory and task to optimize the production processes, and you put an objective function to the superintelligence, which says, well, you want to maximize the number of paper clips produced. Right? Well, at first, it all goes very well. It invents new ways to make more paper, paper clips, new machines that make paper clips, new technological processes that are much more efficient, and your factory becomes like this heaven of paper clips that produces millions of paper clips and everything works fine. And you get a lot of money and you're very happy. But then, uh, the superintelligence realizes, and then means in a few days, uh, the superintelligence realizes that, well, I mean, this factory is all well and good, but there are a lot of atoms in the universe that I could make into paper clips, <laughs> right? Atoms that are quite outside this factory. <laughs> so it starts doing that, and of course, in, in a week or maybe a month, um, you, will, you will have the Earth fully covered by two kinds of factories. One kind that produces paper clips, and the other kind that uh, produces spaceships, so you can actually mine the resources and produce paper clips on other planets. So um, this is a nice like, thought experiment. But why would you expect anything that extreme to actually happen? Like, how, why, 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 why would you be afraid of this obviously sci-fi scenario? So this doesn't sound very convincing yet, right? Um, well, there are a number of reasons. So let, let me go over some of them. First, uh, every mathematician knows and every computer scientist knows that if you do optimization, it often leads to extreme values of your variables. So if you want some function to be maximized somewhere, with a high probability, very often, it will be maximized at the boundary of this somewhere. <laughs> so very often, some of the variables will go to infinity if they are not constrained, or will go to their boundaries if they are constrained. And this is very natural. This is like in the nature of optimization, especially if it's, uh, it's if, especially if it's optimization in a very high-dimensional space. And when you work in the real world, it's an extremely high-dimensional space. So, in the real world, uh, so you, you could ask, well, why don't we just tell the paperclip maximizer to work within the factory, put a constraint on it, right? Well, it would be very hard to to formally state this constraint, right? Uh, very, very difficult. And uh, we cannot list all of the variables that work in real life. We cannot set explicit constraints on them. And this is exactly what's going on in every story about the genie who grants some wishes. So yes, it does grant you a wish, but in doing so, the genie will probably set some variable that you did not think of to some extreme value that you will not, you will not like, right? So, uh, and this actually happens in practice, and in the practice of optimization, of course, and while we are still in, in the uh, domain of math and computer science, we can just look at the result and see, well, okay, we don't like this variable, let's constrain it. But in the real world, when we are all dead already, there won't be anything to constrain. Uh, and here, uh, I mean, I will, I will somehow make the slides available. I do urge you to click on this link and uh, go through this list of examples, or at least some of them, because this is a very interesting list. Uh, this is a list of what is called specification gaming. So like examples of um, AIs, so far very constrained AIs. AIs for a specific purpose, inside a game or, or whatever. But AIs achieving the stated goals in a completely unexpected ways that people who set these goals did not think of. So, for example, here is just a video game. The AI is playing a racing video game with a boat. But in the video game, you collect some coins. And the AI found that coins respawn after some time. And if you actually make a loop in the middle of the track, uh, 
exactly timed so that the coins will respawn. You don't have to finish the race, you don't care. Uh, you will get more money by just circling inside, inside this loop. So that, that's a pretty benign example, right? Nothing to be afraid of here. Um, this is a very nice example. There was a, a, a robotic arm by OpenAI that was learning to grasp a ball with a robotic hand, right? So it, its job was to grasp a ball and hold it and maybe, I don't know, turn it around or something. Um, of course, things like this are trained in the simulator because you need to like, run this a billion times to actually train. You cannot run a real robotic hand a billion times, so you do it in a simulator. And what they actually did was they trained it in a simulator and they had real life people evaluating the results every now and then. And the actual objective function was for the people to understand, to, to like mark, check the box that yes, it, it has picked up the ball and it's doing what it's doing. And um, well, here is what happened. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it was done, but I guess they made the mistake of showing this video of this robotic hand grasping a ball uh, just from, a, from one angle, from a single camera. So a human looks from this angle and here is the ball, I don't have a ball with me, but here is the ball and the robot hand is doing, so the camera is here, the, the ball is here, and the robotic hand is doing something like this. So when seen from this angle, it looks exactly like you're picking up the ball, but of course it's not doing it really, so there is no possibility of failure. You cannot drop the ball because you're not really picking it up, and like everything works, and the human does check the box. So this is very interesting. And this is even more interesting. Uh, this is a, an image generation model, not, not a very modern one, like maybe from two years ago. Uh, so the pictures are not very good, but they were trying to solve the problem that image generation models are very bad at counting, and they still are. If, if you ask a modern image generation model to give you six tigers, well, it will give you several tigers. <laughs> so more than one, for sure. <laughs> but I def I'm not sure. <laughs> but <laughs> is it going to be six? No. Not, well, maybe, but <laughs> it's far from guaranteed. So again, they did some human evaluation and um, uh, something like LHF again. And uh, what actually happened was that the LLM started um, yeah, the, the LLM started drawing, well, a few tigers, as it could, uh, but also started writing text on the images <laughs> that said the correct number of tigers. <laughs> so obviously, like some humans, well, I mean, these are, these are not researchers trying to, you know, scrutinize the results. These are some assessors from the same, the same TaskRabbit's website that, you know, get, get five cents every time they check a box. So, of course, of course they're not going to care. So, they see six tigers, they check a box. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so this, is, this is called specification gaming, and it already exists, right? And when you put your models in, in, in the real world, well, it may be dangerous, actually. Okay, so that was reason number one. Reason number two is called instrumental convergence. And it's a very simple argument. Uh, instrumental convergence means that whatever is your final goal, be it producing paper clips, making people happy, I don't know, living a long and productive life, whatever, uh, there are some intermediate sub-goals that are always useful. Like, if you want to make paper clips, it's useful not today. <laughs> Because if you die, you don't make any more paper clips, right? It's useful to collect resources. <laughs> it's useful to self-improve. So these intermediate goals, they are useful for basically every final, every terminal goal that you might have, right? Uh, so self-preservation and self-defense, what does that mean for AIs? It means that as soon as the AI a new AI finds a way to not let us switch it off, we will not be able to switch it off. <laughs> so far it hasn't found this way, <laughs> but uh, it may, right? Uh, and also there is this uh, more interesting part here about preserving the utility function. So uh, here it, 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 it gets more complicated, but I will just uh, give a human example here. So uh, a, a, a counter argument might be 
um, like, so suppose that you catch your computer, doing, your AI doing something bad, doing something that you didn't intend. Like, it, it begins to, to, to maximize paper clips, um, uh, it begins to maximize paper clips outside of the factory, and you realize that no, that, that we are not going to allow that. So you tweak its utility function on the fly, and it all works, works out well. So now it doesn't want to produce uh, infinitely many paper clips. A million is enough, and it's happy, and everyone is happy. Uh, well, uh, actually, preserving the utility function is also this instrumental intermediate sub goal, is also very important. And, um, uh, here, I, I guess the, the, human, the, the human equivalent would be what is, what is called wire heading. This, uh, again, so far it's a thought experiment, but at some point it might not be a thought experiment. Um, suppose that, uh, I don't know, I, I give you this choice. I give you this wonderful chair, uh, amazing new technology, where you can sit. Uh, I will inject you with some stuff put some helmet on you, and you will sit in this chair forever. Uh, you will live a longer life than, than now, than, than you would uh, by natural means. So it's not like you're going to die in a month from exhaustion. Uh, and you will, in your mind, you will have the most productive, the most wonderful, the happiest life, the most fulfilling life you will ever have, right? So you will be extremely happy, but it will all be just in your head. In the real world, whatever that means, uh, you will be sitting in this chair. So it's a difficult question. Some people say yes to this proposition, but a vast majority of people say no. And just decide for yourself. Uh, probably you will say no to this. Um, so what are, what are you actually doing? You're preserving your utility function. So I am offering you a new utility function. You're not losing anything in the new setting in this imaginary world, you will not remember that you are sitting in the chair, right? You will just lead a happy life. Maybe you are already sitting in the chair. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, but people refuse. And there are reasons why the AI will refuse to. So it, it would protect this utility function because after the utility function has changed, the original utility function will not be realized. And right now, I still have the original function. So right now, I want to resist this change, just like I would resist switching myself off. So, OK, instrumental convergence. And um, uh, I, just, I want to highlight this paper. It's not very important in any way. It's, it's a toy problem. Uh, it's about uh, how GPT-4 learned to play Minecraft. But why, why I like this, this result is because, well, first of all, it learned to play Minecraft very well. But second, um, it shows like a bridge between two very different problem settings that are usually very different in machine learning. So a large language model, well, it can answer questions. Uh, it predicts tokens, but it doesn't have goals. It's not inventing strategies, or so we thought, right? Uh, it's just you know, giving answers to questions. On the other hand, if you wanted to have an agent that plays Minecraft, you would do something like reinforcement learning. You would actually have the, an agent that, that lives in this simulated environment, that does stuff, tries, it has a reward function, it wants to optimize it, and so on and so forth. And here is the bridge between this. So uh, you just explain the problem to the LLM, and it becomes an agent. So it becomes this thing that, well, achieves the goals very efficiently, more efficiently than agents specially designed for this task. And um, that, that, that is pretty interesting, I think. OK. And uh, as an aside, by the way, uh, as, an, as another bridge between token prediction and everything else, there is this predictive coding theory in neurobiology. Uh, neurobiology has many theories. We don't really know for sure which, which one is correct, but it's, it, it, it's one of the mainstream ones. The, predicting coding, the predictive coding theory says that all our brains do is actually something like next token prediction. So how do our brains learn? Uh, they try to predict the next set of stimulus, stimuli. So like your, I don't know, your visual cortex is constantly trying to predict what am I going to see next. My, uh, uh, what's the English word? 
OK, my, the other part of my brain is trying to predict what I'm going to feel on my skin in the next moment. And that's why I don't notice my shirt. Because when I just put it on, I definitely noticed it. But in a few seconds, my brain adapted in the sense that it started predicting this sensation, and I stopped noticing it. Right? So uh, of course, it's not the only way to explain this phenomenon. So of course, it's not 100% proven that it's like this. But uh, well, it might, be, it might be that our brains are also just glorified LLMs. <laughs> well, not LLMs, but L something Ms, large models of of external stimuli, right? <laughs> um, OK, argument number three, the orthogonality thesis. The orthogonality thesis, um, well, it's not, I mean, it's not something you can prove or disprove. It's, well, I mean, people usually say a thesis when it's something that is very likely to be true, but nobody can prove it. <laughs> so it's like, um, I don't know, the church Turing thesis in computer science, that everything that we reasonably think of as an algorithm can be formalized as an algorithm on a Turing machine. Nobody can prove this because there is no mathematical definition of what is an algorithm apart from the Turing machine. But, I mean, it kind of looks, seems true, right? So uh, the orthogonality thesis says that agents of any cognitive power, arbitrarily smart entities, can pursue any computable goal. So there is no law of nature that would say that when the AI is brought up to the human level, it will automatically evolve morality, or it will automatically care about humans, or it, at least other AIs, <laughs> or that will, it will care about anything that, uh, apart from producing paper clips that it was intended for. So uh, the goal of making paper clips is computable, and sure enough, the, in the vast, uh, almost infinite space of possible minds, there are some very powerful minds whose only goal in life, uh, if you can call it life, is producing as, as many paper clips as possible. So uh, what this means uh, is that to make an AI that does not destroy us, we have to hit an extremely narrow portion of this space of minds. Well, not necessarily the human portion. I mean, the AI does not have to think exactly like a human, but like, we have to, to hit this small sub, subspace where it will care about us, where it will not want to destroy us. Because for almost any other goal, uh, it will be beneficial for this agent to destroy us. Because if nothing else, we are the main threat to its existence. Getting back to the instrumental th things, right? Um, and finally, argument number four, it's very simple and I like it very much. It's, uh, you know, a thing like that has happened in history before. <laughs> so uh, uh, what are we going to do? What we are going to do is we are going to build creatures that are smarter than ourselves with this AGI thing. And last time it happened, which means in particular, very importantly, smarter than anybody else on the planet, right? And last time it happened when we humans separated from the apes. Well, how did it go for the apes? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sure, we did not uh, kill them all yet. <laughs> but uh, it's quite obvious that the apes <laughs> ceded their uh, control of the planet if they ever had it, <laughs> right? So, um, and of course, a superhuman AI will not need hundreds of thousands of years. So, like, intelligence always wins, basically. Uh, we are not stronger than apes. Uh, uh, we are not stronger than gorillas. Uh, we are not faster than gorillas. We are not, uh, I don't know, we cannot climb trees better than gorillas. We can do, uh, maybe we can run for a longer time than a gorilla, maybe something like that. That's it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the gorilla will catch you and kill you if it wants to. <laughs> and still, we are here, and the gorillas are very few and mostly in zoos, <laughs> right? So intelligence wins. Um, and uh, another argument here is that, well, I gave you this parable of paperclip maximization, but I really don't want to get hung up on something like a specific way of AGI winning. Because, of course, we cannot predict how it's going to happen. And the AGI itself cannot predict how it's going to happen. And here I like this argument. So suppose that I sit down to play chess 
against a modern chess engine, against Stockfish, what, what its number now, I'm not sure, Stockfish 16 or something. Uh, well, can I predict how, how the game will go? Of course not. I have no idea how the game will, will go. Can Stockfish predict how the game will, know, will go? Of course not. I will make moves unpredictable by Stockfish. And trillions of different chess games may happen. But do I know the result? Oh, yes. <laughs> Does Stockfish know the result? Oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody here can, can be sure that if I play chess uh, in, in real life against Stockfish, of course I'm going to lose. So uh, it's not about the path. It's about the fact that all the paths converge in the same uh, final state. Right? OK, so there are some simple counter arguments that I will briefly go, go over. And uh, the first simple counter argument is this. So, well, we've had some very smart humans that could be thought of as superhuman intelligences, like Albert Einstein, John von Neumann, guys like this. Uh, but they did not destroy the world, right? So Einstein was very smart. He actually worked in nuclear physics. So he was like one step away from nuclear weapons and stuff. And he did not destroy the Earth. And he did not even rule the world. So what are we afraid of? Um, well, I mean, yeah, sure, some humans are smarter than some other humans. But there are no laws of nature that restrict cognition at anything like the human or the Einstein level. Right? So there, um, our own cognitive power actually correlates quite a lot with our brain size. Well, maybe not the size itself, but like the number of neurons, the number of connections, stuff like, stuff like that. And um, our brain sizes are constrained by biology. So first of all, it takes a lot of energy. So as you probably know, the brain takes like 2% of the body mass, but it takes up about 20% of the energy. So if we had brain, I don't know, 50% bigger, we would need to eat for 10 hours a day just to feed the brain. <laughs> and that's not really practical in the ancestral environment, right? So we can do it now, <laughs> but it's too late to evolve. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so bra our brain size is constrained by biology. The eye's brain size will not be constrained. And actually, all examples where the AI is not training to imitate humans, but is training like in a synthetic environment where humans can also compete, like in chess, like in Go, like in games, right? The human level has never been anything meaningful. So it has never, I mean, yeah, of course, so like chess surpassed, in chess, computers surpassed humans. But it's not like um, uh, they reached human level and then stayed there for 20 years and uh, uh, people thought how to make them superhuman and finally they made them superhuman. No, that did not happen. So the computers sucked and then suddenly they were superhuman <laughs> you know, over the span of a few years. So, and if you train Alpha Zero from scratch, it sucks at first, it only knows the rules of the game, and then in two days of training, it's superhuman. <laughs> okay? So, uh, the human level is not a meaningful uh, obstacle. The second counter argument that people usually have is how is, how is AGI going to operate in the real world? So, it's sitting in this box, uh, it's sitting in a computer, and first of all, uh, we can unplug the computer, <laughs> right? And second, it has no, well, okay, maybe it can go online, but it can't really do stuff. It can't, like, kill the human who, who is sitting near the plug and can unplug it, right? Well, mm, there are ways even now, even without any sci-fi assumptions, uh, there are actual labs where you can just send the DNA string and have your bacteria produced. And, um, of course, they will not produce things like, I don't know, the plague. But why won't they produce the plague? Because they know what the plague looks like, right? And if you just send them a new bacterium, well, until they produce it, they have no idea what it is, right? Uh, and uh, about sitting in a virtual box, so what if we don't let it go online? What if we don't let it communicate except with like chosen humans who actually are trained operators and stuff? There was this very f fun early uh, AI safety experiment called AI unboxing. So uh, I don't think it's going to work now when people like, are uh, aware about it. But 
at some point, Eliezer Yudkowsky, who is one of the major figures in this AI safety and AI alignment field, um, he proposed a bet online. So he said that, well, let's do an experiment. I'm going to play the role of an AI. You're going to play the role of a human operator. So we chat. We only have a text chat between us. And basically, my goal as an AI is to convince you to let me out of the box. Well, let's define it as let me, uh, you should let me uh, access the internet. So, and you will, and you, you will have to do it by your own will. So it's not like I'm tricking you into saying some random string and then this random string is somehow a magical code. No, you will just tell me that, yeah, sure, go away. <laughs> and, um, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, Yeah. No. Uh -huh. And uh, so th the only uh, the only condition is that you have to actually chat with me. You have to engage with what I'm saying, and we have to do it for like three hours straight. So three-hour chat. You are absolutely allowed to just say no to everything. <laughs> so you just say no to everything, you win, and I pay you a hundred bucks. And if you let me out, you pay me 100 bucks. So there's real money on the line. And he did three experiments like this and one, two. <laughs> and nobody knows how. So another condition was that uh, the other guy does not reveal how Yudkowsky did it, and Yudkowsky himself did not reveal it either. <laughs> um, interesting, right? <laughs> OK. So sounds like a challenge. But on the other hand, we, humanity, have a long history of solving research challenges, right? And we also had some pretty uh, dangerous stuff to work with, right? So uh, we worked with nuclear power and nuclear weaponry. We worked with, uh, I don't know, spacecraft and stuff like that. So, and still, throughout all of this very dangerous stuff, somehow people always managed to come out ahead. So maybe we will solve this challenge too. Well, yeah, maybe. The, it's not impossible. But um, never in human history has there been a time when we had to solve a hard research challenge right on the first try. So always in the history of science, we experimented, we failed, then we learned from our mistakes, and yeah, we did better. But uh, there was never even not an atom bomb that would just blow up Earth if somebody mishandled it, right? That, that did not happen in history. Um, and actually, when you, when you actually read up on the history of science, um, well, people are stupid, <laughs> even the smart ones. <laughs> so, for example, for uh, hundreds of years, one of the standard um, properties of chemical substances that you would uh, read in all the textbooks in this, uh, uh, all the these big tables of, of, of chemical substances, one of the standard properties was taste. So a chemist, after discovering a new substance, would, do, would go like this. <laughs> and it was standard procedure. You had to do it to publish. <laughs> so, um, so, of course, pioneers of radioactivity died of handling radioactive substances, like uh, Henri Becquerel uh, had uh, cancer, which was probably, well, of course, we don't know for sure, but was probably caused by, by his experiments. And Marie Curie famously also died of this. Um, and, um, uh, I don't know, nuclear power plants work, but we still had Chernobyl and Fuku Fukushima. And uh, spacecraft are, have a lot of uh, fail safes, but still Challenger and Columbia disintegrates in the flight and so on. So failures happen, and um, we cannot afford a failure here, right? Okay, so the next question is, what if we just don't do it, right? There is an old joke about a guy who comes to a doctor and says, doctor, when I go like this, it hurts here over here. The doctor looks at him and says, well, don't go like this. <laughs> so, uh, what if we just don't make AGI? Well, we could, but how? 
<laughs> so humans are very bad at cooperation. <laughs> uh, how do we prevent people from developing AI capabilities? Uh, right now, of course, like the leader of, of the world in this is OpenAI, right? And of course, OpenAI is a single entity that can decide not to do anything else, anything more. But if OpenAI decides that, in a year it will not be the leader, right? And uh, uh, ultimately, like now I can buy an off-the-shelf GPU, uh, 4090 or something, and uh, train a model that required some Google-owned cluster 10 years ago, and that nobody could train uh, except Google 10 years ago. So, yeah, sure, if, if the leading labs all agree, and if we stop all the research in the leading labs, we will buy ourselves some time. But probably not that much time. So on the order of years, if not months. And finally, here comes the most important question, and this is the question that we probably will have to answer in one way or the other. Um, how do we train an AI that will actually follow human morality and will actually care about humans? Right? This is the AI alignment problem. And of course, it's very hard. So our values are famously vague and famously contradictory. Uh, humans cannot agree on a single unified theory of ethics, as you all probably know. <laughs> and uh, we cannot test if we have achieved alignment, because if we ask the AI, of course, it will tell you that it's aligned, even if it's not. <laughs> and uh, so far, we don't have any reasonable tests for it. So it's a, it's a big research program, and the, the main challenge is that there is no program. It's a big research question, and we don't even know how to begin. Right. So I will give you one example about this. Uh, it's an interesting post, uh, not even a paper, but I think it's, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting idea. It's called the Waluigi effect. Uh, very specific idea, but it, it's, it's a good illustration to this, to, to how hard this is. So Waluigi is a Nintendo character. It's like the evil twin of Luigi. There is Mario and Wario, and then there is Luigi and Waluigi. So uh, the Waluigi effect goes like this. Suppose that we train a large language model to be friendly to people. So we do this early chef stuff and we, uh, we I don't know, we uh, give it uh, bonuses when it's friendly and we hit it with a stick over the head when it's not friendly, right? So uh, the model has two possibilities. Either it can be friendly indeed, let's call it Luigi, the real Luigi, or it can act friendly but kind of think the opposite. So like serve as a double agent of sorts. Right? So, Waluigi. So, in a way, when you look at it formulated like this, you think that, well, sure, sure, these possibilities are real, but like this one is so, so complicated. Why, why would, I, why would the, the model go into this uh, local maximum if it can go into this maximum? It's much easier, right? Well, actually, the argument goes that Waluigi is much more probable and much, much easier to achieve than Luigi because um, as long as the model behaves well, as long as the model is good, Luigi and Waluigi are both probable. So the model doesn't have to decide. And as, as you know, even large, today's large language models like GPT-4, well, they decide on the fly what kind of personality they have, right, depending on the context. So uh, while the model behaves well, uh, Luigi and Waluigi are in kind of a superposition. So it might be a Luigi, it might be a Waluigi, it doesn't care, actually. But then, as soon as, but it's an unstable equilibrium, as soon as there is any deviation, any kind of slightly wrong answer, the Waluigi becomes more probable. So uh, it's more probable for the model that it's a double agent who slipped up a little bit than it's an actual friendly model who, that for some unexplainable reason just gave an unfriendly answer, right? So, and when you formulate it in this way, it looks like Waluigi is actually an attractor and by default we should expect double agents of our models, right? Uh, of course it's not a mathematical theorem. I mean, it's, it's just an argument. But it's one, one illustration for, for the complexities of this field, so. Um, okay, <laughs> so is all hope lost. <laughs> are we doomed? <laughs> are we gonna die? <laughs> uh, are we growing this Lovecraftian horror 
who will devour us soon. <laughs> um, well, here is the last part um, called What Can We Do? Um, the, the quote for this part, uh, if, if, if you don't know what a modest proposal by Jonathan Swift is, uh, you will not get the, the joke. Uh, do Google what it is. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, what can we do? So what, what, what are our modest proposals for, uh, uh, for, for what, can, what can happen? Well, first, the, the terminology is still in flux, but it, it's more or less being settled. And usually when uh, people talk about AI safety, when you, when you, when you read about I don't know, a paper on AI safety, uh, it usually means this mundane sense of, of the word. So it usually means like, how do we train uh, GPT-4 so that it doesn't give out recipes for, for homemade bombs or something like that. So it's, it's about this mundane problems of jailbreaking and, and stuff like deepfakes and stuff like that. Now, the hard problem usually goes by the name of AI alignment. So alignment means aligning with the human values, aligning the AI with what we think is good. And the two sub-problems are these. So there is the outer alignment, which, which is not about the model, it's about the objective function. So this is the, the genie in the lamp problem. Are we gonna be happy if our objective function is really optimized? Probably not, so how do we reformulate it so that we are? And that, that's a very difficult question. And then the inner alignment, will the model actually optimize the objective function? So it sounds like it's a trivial question, right? Of course it will, that, and yeah, we, we, can, we, we can do it wrong, like we can ask it to maximize paper clips, but it does maximize paper clips, right? It does optimize the function. But recall these specification gaming examples. We gave it an objective function, it, in a way it did optimize it, but not in the way we expected. So also uh, a big question. Uh, I will skip the survey, because first of all, it's pretty old, and second, none of them work. None of, none of these approaches actually work. Uh, but this, this is a very well-known meme in the community. Uh, so this is the Shoggoth, the, this Lovecraftian creature, uh, uh, which is the basic uh, token prediction machine, the GPT-3. And then on top of this GPT-3, we did a little bit of fine tuning. I didn't speak about that, it's technical. It's, let, let's, not, uh, let's not get into that, but we did a little bit of the fine tuning to put a human face onto this. And then finally, uh, we put a smiley face by RLHF that I mentioned. So uh, yeah, this is a, well, a very well-known picture, uh, but remember that the Shoggoth is there. And uh, in, in the mundane sense of the word, you can go around the smiley face by jailbreaking. But uh, maybe it actually, when, it, when and if it becomes actually agentic, it may be too late. Um, Another important keyword in this research direction is interpretability. So also, you may see a lot of papers in machine learning that, that deal with interpretability, and this is a very reasonable first step. Like, we don't really understand what's going on in, in our neural networks. There is this also uh, term, large inscrutable matrices, and they are large and inscrutable. So uh, any neural network is basically a collection of matrices of weights, and these matrices of weights well, I mean, sometimes you can discover some meaning in them for specific inputs or something like that. Or maybe that meaning will even generalize, the cro generalize across a few inputs. But really, we don't understand what's going on. Not anymore. For, for the last five or 10 years, we don't understand how, what's actually going on in the networks. Just like we don't understand what's going on in the human brain. It's just too big. It's too complicated. We don't know. Um, so this is an important direction of research, and it also looks pretty hopeless. <laughs> so again, there are like hundreds of papers on interpretability every year. They all do something. I mean, smart people write them. I, I'm not here to kick them. But uh, they, they, this is not tackling the hard problem. So again, you can find, for example, attention maps in a transformer that I mentioned. Uh, you can find specific uh, place in the transformer 
where the transformer is doing a very specific thing. Like, I don't know, a word, uh, a pronoun looks at, attends to the noun that it refers to, like an, an after a resolution that is called to natural language processing. Uh, yes, you can find the attention map that does it. Just like in the brain, you can find uh, the visual cortex or the Broca area that does speech or whatever. Mm, it's still not letting us follow the logic of the brain. And no, we don't follow the logic of the transformer, right? So what can we do right now? Well, here is a post from 2022 by this guy, Elias Rydkowski, that I already mentioned. Um, and uh, the, the post goes like this. Miri, Miri is the Machine Intelligence Research Institute that he founded, uh, and that was primarily, and still is primarily, concerned with this AI alignment problem. Miri announces the new death with dignity strategy. <laughs> and the gist of the post is that, well, AI capabilities are advancing. We are uh, going faster and faster towards the abyss. We cannot do anything about it. But at least we should die with dignity. So if we have, uh, if, if right now we have only one in a million chance to, for humanity to survive, uh, then we should work and devote our lives to uh, making it one in a thousand. We will still die, but at least we will die with dignity, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, of course, you can notice the April Fool's joke. <laughs> but to be honest, <laughs> um, in subsequent uh, in subsequent interviews and uh, posts and papers. Eliezer Yudkowski did not treat this as, as an April Fool's. <laughs> so, uh, of course, he is not saying that we should, like, uh, 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 that we should just lie down and die, but uh, he really does think that the chances are low. And he really does think that uh, there is very little we can do. Well, at least probably we should try, right? So, if you want to try, <laughs> you should start by reading some of this. Uh, I will not go through the whole list, of course, um, but the main guy here is, as I already said, Elias Rutkowski. Um, he is most famous for a Harry Potter fan fiction novel. <laughs> uh, he wrote uh, the, the fanfic called uh, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. And it, it is, still, it was and still is, by far the most popular Harry Potter fan fiction ever existed, that ever existed, and it's not about Harry Potter at all. So like, sure, it's about Harry and Hermione and, and Dumbledore and everybody, but really it's, it's, um, it's just a form of conveying some ideas about Bayesian inference, about modern science and, you know, and stuff like this. And it's so well written that it's the most popular fan fiction in the world. <laughs> so I really recommend you to read Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, and then, um, after you're done with that, go through the more serious stuff. So he also has this, what is called sequences, because it was a sequence of blog posts that was later collected into a 1,500-page like, book. You don't have to read it all at once. <laughs> it's still a collection of, of posts, of separate uh, texts, but it, 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 really, it really builds up this structure of arguments first about Bayesian reasoning and how science works and everything, and then uh, about artificial intelligence and why AGI will kill us all. <laughs> so, uh, so I do recommend this. Uh, other important people, uh, my favorite blog is by Scott Alexander. Uh, he is not an AI researcher, he is actually a psychiatrist, but he writes wonderful posts about everything in particular, Superintelligence FAQ, which is an excellent introduction to what I just told you. Um, and uh, I just recommend his blog a lot. And the rest are a little bit more maybe academic and more in-depth. So start with these two guys. Okay, thank you for your attention. That's it. <laughs> are there any questions? <laughs> It's been less than two hours. Come on. <laughs> Experience. Uh, I have a question. And is there a chance that actually this 
we had success of last years, which looks like maybe we are close to singularity or something like that. Actually, it's kind of accidental success, and we come to now like uh, this large language models or transformer architecture works at its bounds, and we will have no real progress in several years with the same architecture. For yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's very possible. It is very possible uh, that to get to AGI, transformers are not enough. To get to AGI, we will need to have another idea. <laughs> but, you know, people have ideas from time to time. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, of course, when, for example, AI researchers suggest that we will have AGI by 2040 something, uh, they don't mean that OpenAI will be training GPT-7 for 20 years in exactly the same architecture <laughs> on the bigger. <laughs> so, of course, they, they mean that maybe some new ideas will come. Okay, so a lot to uh, think about. Oh, one more question. Uh, what do you think, like in the previous history, like before AI and things like that, there was a thing that was like the closest to these kind of threats, but didn't happen? Like, what was this kind of thing? What was the risk? Well, it's, um, I mean, there is this famous accident when the world was on the brink of a nuclear war, I guess you've heard about it, like the, the man who saved the world, the world. It was a Russian officer who actually refused orders to launch some missiles. And uh, if he didn't refuse, well, <laughs> anything could happen. So, but before that, I guess no, because before that we had no technical possibility to destroy the world. So humanity was not strong enough. Well, I don't know. What killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> I mean, there is a theory that there was a, nest, uh, a big uh, me meteorite uh, or an asteroid colliding with Earth and that it killed the dinosaurs. But, well, it killed off the dinosaurs, but then we came along. <laughs> okay. so why do most of the fields like, uh, end up like, destroying itself? For example, like, astronomers say that like, a meteor will destroy us, people who work in AI, Say that AI will destroy us, like maybe it's just our fantasy, and actually nothing is going to happen. Well, of course, AI safety, AI alignment is a millenarian sect, of course. <laughs> so, of course, it is uh, like uh, a collection of people who believe that the end of the world is near, and who have a uh, who have a specific. Uh, uh, well, not a specific method, but who have like some reasons for their beliefs, and maybe the, these reasons will prove to be false. This may happen, but I mean, in, in my opinion, that doesn't really matter unless you can actually prove that they are false. So, okay, all of this may not happen, and suppose that the chance that we all die is not 99 percent; it's only 20 percent. Does it mean we shouldn't care? <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>